Digital evangelism is really easy. Please remember to like, comment and share this video. Also, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. All these things give us favour with the YouTube algorithm and help our content to be seen by more people. God bless. I have personally been witness to the benefit of small fellowship groups and I endorse everything said in the article below. So this is now taken from 10 reasons why your church should have small groups by Daniel Frofall. So he says, I used to be skeptical of small groups. I thought it was a bit too faddish, touchy feely and created Christian social clubs instead of fostering true discipleship. Maybe some small groups are guilty of these charges. However, on the whole, small groups are a valuable means of helping people in the church. They go by different names, small groups, cell groups, care groups, discipleship groups, grace groups, breakout groups, whatever they are called. The basic idea is the same, a small gathering of people interested in spiritual growth. And here's why small groups are important. Small groups foster close relationships and integral community. The small group atmosphere is ready made for building friendships. People talk more in small groups of people. People are quick to recognize needs and help to meet them. The relationships formed within small groups form a strong fabric within a church. Relationships that are formed outside of the sometimes artificial setting of a church service are relationships that will endure and strengthen over time. I want if you want to comment on any of these, please feel free to interrupt. So people talk more in small groups. People are quick to recognize needs and help uh, people meet them and help meet them. Relationships are formed and they form a strong fabric within the church and relationships that are formed outside of the sometimes artificial setting of a church service our relationships that will endure in strength for the time. I always talk about coming to church and just high-fiving people after church and, oh, how was your week? That's not that's not relationship. That's not friendship. That's small talk. Can't build real relationships like that. Number two, small groups provide a comfortable introduction for non-believers to the Christian faith. He says, I'm skeptical that inviting people to church is the best means of evangelism. Most of us tend to fear relationship forming, especially when it involves sharing our faith with someone. That is a natural and understandable fear. Inviting someone instead to a small group meeting provides a way to involve a believer directly into a community of believers. Watching them live out their faith, listening to them pray, hearing them share God's work in their life and learning more about the Bible. The non-believer is more likely to ask questions, get answers, and form relationships with the believers. Small groups are a powerful missional tool allowing for the greater spread of the gospel among non-believers in the community. Number three, small groups provide an ideal way to care for the needs of the people within the church. When one believer in a small group is struggling struggling financially, emotionally, spiritually, and socially, etc., it is much easier for the members of the group to notice and provide help. The structure of a small group is essentially a community of believing friends. Friends should help one another, especially Christian friends. Is anybody noticing that everything we're reading about here is what we've proved in YAM? Small groups provide yeah. a way for Christians to live out their faith instead of merely hearing more preaching or teaching. If Sunday morning is for listening, then the rest of the week is for living. Whether it's discussing the Sunday sermon, talking about a spiritual battle, or simply praying for one another, small groups create a context for Christians to live out their faith in real life. Let me just stop here and say, the yam developed into what it developed into because this was lacking in our churches. This is why we started YAM. The first aim of YAM was to bring uh, prayer 
and fellowship into people's homes to demonstrate to people that the spirit of God doesn't just reside in a building. And although we um, are obviously not a church and not, not attached to any one church, our hope is that, and our hope has been and is that every church would adopt this type of model in, in the sense that they don't take church out the home. Yes, continue with your Sunday service or whatever, but make sure that there's home fellowships within your church because that is going to strengthen your church. As you know, we all came from different churches and it strengthened our bonds even across our different churches. Now, some of us go to the same church, but the point is it works. And it will work so much better for a church. So imagine you have a church that's in, I don't know, North London. Most of the people in the church maybe live in North London, but there's some in East, there's some in West. If you have home fellowships in North, East and West, Everybody does not have to be rushing to get to the building on in the midweek. Everybody does not have to be trying to, uh, and we know how busy people are now, everybody's not trying to drive across the city to get to the prayer meeting on Tuesday, to get to the midweek seven on Wednesday. Why not appoint some elders in each area to have those people in those vicinities meet up in the midweek, then when you come on Sunday now, you're getting some real fire because those people were in close fellowship. They were really praying. It wasn't like you came to church and you just listened to five people pray for an hour and you didn't say anything. No, you got to give your own testimony. You got to pray into the... In, I, don't, anyway, I don't want to skip too far ahead. But anyway, we'll see. Small groups participate in focused prayer for one another. Prayer cannot be overrated, but it is often under practice. Small groups can better participate in prayer for one another. In one of my small group meetings, each of the people that were present took a few minutes to tell others about their particular uh, challenges or concerns. Then as soon as we finished, the person right next to him took a minute or so to pray for him. Small groups makes for pray great prayer meetings. When, if you as a church now are having these small groups in various areas, you are building not only relationship between people, you're building people's prayer life. Because if we come to a meeting now, a church service on, a, say, a midweek, and, you know, something's happened in your family, but you're not really in the mood to tell everybody about what happened at your child's school or you might not even get the opportunity if you're in your little small fellowship group in your area now the chances are you get to tell that story right then that person who's sitting next to you who might never know you before maybe never even was really into you that much they hear your story the compassion of god comes upon them and they pray for you that breaks down the barrier between you and that person that might have existed because you can't hate someone and be praying for them at the same time. Or you can't really have barriers when you're praying for people and praying into people's life. All of these things is what Jesus established with these disciples. He understood what he was doing, but we think we're so smart that we have broken away from it now and done our own thing. But as you on the line know, this stuff works. And, and and a lot of you would have never told the stories that you've told in our prayer meetings in your church where you came from. Not, not I'm not saying that because now you dislike the church. I'm saying that personal uh, relationship or the trust that you had to say in the group, you don't necessarily have it in a larger group. But this is what small fellowship groups help to do help to bring us out of ourselves, help to make us more bold, help to make us more prayerful, help so many things. Small groups provide a comfortable atmosphere for openness. One thing I like about small groups is that we meet in homes. There are at least 26 references in the New Testament that talk about believers meeting in homes or being a part of a household. Not all references are in Acts. Homes are usually comfortable places devoid of pews, PA systems, and stages. They are places where people can open up, listen, learn, and grow. Small groups allow for mutual edification among believers. It is easy to depend on the professionals 
to give us our spiritual food. According to the Bible, God gives spiritual gifts to all believers, not just the guy who preaches on Sunday morning. These gifts are for the benefit of the whole church. Every Christian should minister to other Christians with his or her gifts. This happens most naturally, effectively, and purposefully in small groups. Plus, we start to realize that other believers face the same problems as we do. Edification is at work. We have, I have seen in Yam, people who are gifted, but who necessarily wasn't always either allowed to operate in their gift in the main in their like in their main church service or didn't have much experience i have seen yam cause people to go from beginners in their gift to now mature um operators in their gifting and calling why because the small group gave that opportunity also we are here to build each other up and to edify in that small setting people are less nervous to move in the spirit. Because if your pastor, a lot of people, if their pastor has never said to them, oh, I believe you have this gift or I see this in you, they obviously, if they're in a church service, they might hear God talk to them, but they're not comfortable to really operate. What a small group allows for is for you to get more confident because you need to exercise your gift. This is the issue with our churches today. People can't exercise their gift because we've put everything on one service, two hours on a Sunday morning. That is not time for the body, for everybody in the body to exercise. So there has to be fellowship outside of that one service. And small groups allow for mutual edification. We have seen it. We have proven it. We have the testimonies. Also, it allows us to realize that we're more alike than we are different. We all have the same problems. And now when I tell my testimony about, our, you know, for example, I could say that, you know, I don't know, I was struggling with money or whatever at this time. Someone's going to be in there who would have struggled and they can... They can now minister to me. Now, imagine the person who ministers to me now might be someone who would never get a chance to speak in a church setting. But because we're in a smaller setting, they now, who are normally shy, get to minister to me. And that not only edifies me, it builds them up. It makes them more confident. Listen. I'm sorry, Brother Michael. You know you chipped out for a second. Or was it just my phone? Oh, yeah. I got cut off as well. Um, you um you cut out a part where you said um and now when I give my testimony and then you went blank for about thirty seconds. Okay, so I was saying that my razor issue in the prayer group that I've had. For example, I say you know I was struggling with money, and someone else now who's shy and you know who probably would never get a chance to speak in a in a in a in a church service or setting that person now when they give their testimony of what they've been through you know they probably they, for in this situation they've had money problems before but god brought them out when they now begin to testify to me not only am i edified and built up they are edified and built up because they are now coming out of their shell they are now um exercising a you know something that they don't get to exercise that person might be an evangelist or that person might be well trans after they're shy they're not an evangelist but that person might have a ministry but because they don't ever get to exercise it in church they don't really know now when they start to testify to me in this um in this setting it it, it um it proves or it, it builds them up and and now makes them more confident and now the next time something happens you know to someone else they feel more comfortable to speak to them and then out of that they start to develop and grow and then they now come to understand their gifting but the, the the point is is that everybody has a ministry therefore everybody has to exercise their ministry everybody can't do that on a sunday so you need small groups for this reason also because everybody has to be exercised now it's not necessarily that you always have to exercise in a church service or even in a small group you should be exercising in your family, uh, at work or on the phone or whoever, but 
these groups help to bring people out of their shell and help them to even understand for themselves what their gifting and their calling is because they get to do things that they would never do in a service. Obviously, everything in decency and order. Small groups encourage better learning. Listening to a sermon is a great way to learn the word, but it is easy to become detached or daydream during a sermon. We become passive listeners, not so in a small group. When a few people are together, every individual is expected to be involved and to participate. This active involvement is an effective way to learn better. There are some churches where you will never be asked for a testimony. You'll never be asked for exaltation, ever. How are you going to grow? How does even the pastor know that you're growing? This, this is what's happening in the kingdom. This is why people are remaining babies. Because no one's actively seeking out what is your gift? What is your calling? I can't necessarily find that on a Sunday morning. This is why Paul told Timothy, ordain elders, plural. Because if we were doing, if all of our church had small groups, the elder there could be saying, okay, this one is, this one's got a gift in prophecy. This one, I think, is an evangelist. Because I'm seeing them operate in these groups. Because how do you think you're going to do something on a large scale if you haven't done it on a small scale? Everybody's like your ministry shouldn't begin in the pulpit. Your ministry shouldn't begin in a convocation or a convention. Your ministry is supposed to begin like that in a, in, a, in a small situation. So the reason why our churches are full of babies, because there's no time, that, that no one is actively seeking to bring out what is inside of people. No one is actively seeking to put peace priest in their pews. We have the system of church has just made it Oh, you're either a platform minister or you're not a minister. No, but the Bible says that the body is supposed to edify and build up and that everybody's supposed to have a priesthood. Everybody's given the word of reconciliation. Everybody's been given um, the ministry. You've been given a gift. You've been given a call. How do we tease that out? It has to come somewhere. And the best setting, the setting we get from the word, the way it was done in the old days was small groups, as we saw in there. ABC of um, of church. Small groups provide a source of encouragement and accountability. It's easy to slip in and out of church unnoticed. It's not just mega churches where this happens. In an average sized church of 100 to 150, people may be coming each Sunday service but not getting involved. These people, people may need accountability in their lives, encouragement in their walk with God, or help in some way. Small groups provide a way to better meet these needs. 10. Small groups cultivate help, sorry, small groups help to cultivate leadership within the church. Someone has to lead a small group meeting or at least facilitate the discussion. Unless your entire church is the small group, unlikely, they will need to be leaders other than the pastor. Thus, the small groups give opportunities for leadership development within the church and see even this guy he wrote it he said other than the pastor there doesn't have to be one pastor in the church you can have multiple pastors it's not about one man at the top calling the shots so there doesn't there doesn't have to be one pastor like if you are ordained if an elder is a pastor so if you're ordaining elders to run these small groups these are pastors too and that pastor there shouldn't be no one pastor who has like ultimate final say. This is the problem. This is why the system of church has come the way it is because one man has had final and authority say they haven't been accountable to anybody. So if this man says it's like this, it's like this. That's not what Jesus set up. We've seen, we've proven that already. But that's the point I'm saying is that is the issue because leadership is plural. It's not singular. And a, a lot of the times it's become singular because of the pyramid system we operate in. So having been a leader of a small group, I can confirm that God will make you sensitive to the needs of the group. Even when not leading, if you are spiritual, God will make you sensitive to the needs of your fellow brethren. The brotherhood or sisterhood and mutual edification is not restricted to the leader or the leaders of the group. When you're in a small group, and I know you all have been in Yam and each and, and, and in your own experience you have felt god make you sensitive 
to the need of someone else. I think I've experienced it from every one of you. You have either given a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. But Sister Sabrina, you have something to say. Go ahead. I'm so confused. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Your hands are up. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so you said about, I just want to establish more what you said mm. regarding having multiple pastors. Yeah. Wouldn't that cause more problems in terms of like conflict of ideas? Why? It's one spirit. So if there's a conflict of ideas, then someone's not in the spirit. Because we have to understand what a pastor is. It's just a shepherd. It's just a leader. Someone to help the sheep to grow and to fulfill their potential and to train them. So why does why could why couldn't there be more than one that's my question <laughs> if they've got the same spirit why does it why does they why 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 would there be a conflict that means they would be carnal there shouldn't be a conflict if god has given everyone the same the same spirit and we we've all bought into one vision why does there have to be one man that has the final say that's what the world created that's what Jesus said not to do in the church. He said, don't operate um, like the world do. Peter said, don't lord it over God's heritage. The idea of there just being one man at the top who has ultimate say is not biblical. So there's, I'm missing two other hands raised. It's, it's the Dion as well. Go ahead. Um, I think we've got to remember that the vision and the plan, the blueprint, doesn't actually come from the pastor. Right. They are facilitators of the vision and the plan of God. So it, 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 it's, it's necessary for and for one man to carry the weight of God's vision of God's plan it's a lot because it, it it consumes them it when we're sleeping what you have to realize that when we are sleeping our pastors if there are if they're good pastors they're up praying they're 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 seeking God and then you have everyone um calling and and whatever in and then they have their own personal life to deal with they've got their own family they've got their own issues so it's a lot so for one man to bear that weight it is it, 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 it it's a lot so imagine they have more than one and they can't be in conflict because the vision doesn't come from them and the one who gives the vision is not conflicted or isn't confused yeah does that answer the question sister sabrina yeah it does yeah yeah so this this goes back to I can't remember what week it was when my, when we talked about the pyramid system of leadership